Welcome to the Wayne Besson Show. Today's show begins with Wayne's Weekly Whirlwind, a fast and furious trip through the week's top news stories. We now turn to Washington, where the House of Representatives voted 258 to 169 in favor of a bill that provides federal recognition for same-sex marriages. The Respect for Marriage Act won Senate approval last month. The measure now goes to President Joe Biden's desk to be signed into law. Every Democrat in the House voted for the bill. 39 Republicans voted in favor too, which is huge because now this is bipartisan. However, one Republican Congresswoman, Vicki Hartzler, gave a weepy histrionic speech opposing the bill. Fortunately, Andrew Hartzler, her gay nephew, took her to task on TikTok. You must see this. It's amazing. Take a look. Today, a United States Congresswoman, my Aunt Vicki, started crying because gay people like me can get married. I hope and pray that my colleagues will find the courage to join me in opposing this misguided and this dangerous bill. I yield back. So despite coming out to my aunt this past February, I guess she's still just as much as a homophobe. Let's be clear, Obergefell is not in danger, but people and institutions of faith are. Aunt Vicki, that's not right. Institutions of faith like religious universities are not being silenced. They're being empowered by the US government to discriminate against tens of thousands of LGBTQ students because of religious exemptions, but they still receive federal funding. The bill's implications submit to our ideology or be silenced. It's more like you want the power to force your religious beliefs onto everyone else. And because you don't have that power, you feel like you're being silenced. But you're not. You're just gonna have to learn to coexist with all of us. And I'm sure it's not that hard. The Respect for Marriage Act was deemed necessary because conservative members of the Supreme Court expressed support for revisiting the legalization of same-sex marriage, in spite of the fact that 70% of Americans approve of marriage equality. But these right-wing activist judges work for a radical movement, not America. So this legislation was necessary. But to win conservative support, concessions had to be made for so-called religious freedom and freedom of conscience. For example, some homophobic Christian conservatives don't want to bake wedding cakes for gay couples or create websites for them. What these religious zealots did not anticipate is that their bigotry offends the religious belief and the consciences of other Americans. Which brings us to a restaurant in Virginia that canceled a reservation for an event hosted by a conservative Christian organization. NBC News reports, the restaurant's Instagram account said that it opposes this group because it's a political organization that seeks to, quote, deprive women and LGBTQ plus persons of their basic rights. This falls into the category of be careful what you wish for. If right-wing Christians can pick and choose with whom they associate, so can everyone else. And many Americans don't want to aid in a bet bigotry. I predicted this would happen many years ago. My organization, Truth Wins Out, created a spoof ad dramatizing this. Take a look. We have for five tickets this Saturday, and you can just pick them up at will call. Okay, great. I'll see you then. Bye. Hi. How can I help you? Hi. One for There's That Man Gina. No, I'm sorry. It's actually There's That Man Gina. The comma is silent. Okay. My mistake. Um, one for There's That Man Gina. Well, that'll be $12.50. Uh, that's including tax. Oh. I'm sorry. I don't want to sound like a pervert, but I couldn't help but notice that crucifix on your neck. Are you a Christian? Yes. Yes, I am. It pains me to say this, but I can't sell you a ticket. See, this theater is part of a church, the Church of Harvey Firestein, and 
As a believer, it's a sin to sell tickets to or perform in front of Christians. Father Harvey believes that Christians' lack of culture, uninspired clothing choices, and the worst form of rock music prevents them from truly understanding and appreciating and thereby threatening the sanctity of great theater. So as I said, I'm sorry, but my religion and the religion of this theater is very important, so you're going to need to see a show somewhere else. But hey, I think there's a theater down the street that's showing the passion of the Christ in HD. I know you people get off on that sort of thing. right along to the Brittany Grenier situation. The Biden administration deserves credit for bringing home basketball star Brittany Grenier, who was held hostage by the Russian government. She was arrested on politically motivated, trumped up drug charges. The Russians were lashing out because they couldn't take Kiev, so instead they took Brittany Grenier. Real brave of them. This was a little easier, I suppose, than fighting actual Ukrainians with guns in the trenches. After 10 months in captivity, Grenier boarded the plane and was told, we are taking you home to the free world. Then she landed, looked out the window and said, the free world? What the hell are we doing in Texas? Okay, that didn't happen. But Texas Governor Greg Abbott isn't that big of an improvement over Vladimir Putin. So the right wing is freaking the hell out right now. They're feigning outrage because the prisoner exchange included convicted Russian arms dealer Viktor Bal. He's known as the Merchant of Death, so I'm guessing he's not a very nice guy. But the right wing's rantings and ravings are disingenuous and absurd. They are claiming that Bout's release will end up killing Americans. But these same tut-tutters were wildly cheering President Donald Trump when he released 5,000 members of the Taliban, terrorists. This includes 400 hardcore religious extremists who are likely to enter the terrorism industry once again. Where was the right-wing outrage then? Where was this anger? Didn't exist because they're a bunch of political hacks. It's really disturbing, no, disgusting, how Republicans are playing politics with national security. In better times, politics used to stop at the water's edge, but nothing is sacrosanct with today's Republican Party. We should all be celebrating the release of an American kidnapped and placed in captivity. We should not use it as an excuse to launch thinly veiled partisan attacks. It's just gross, un-American, and unpatriotic. We now move to Arizona, where Senator Kirsten Cinema is nothing if not cinematic. The moment Raphael Warnock won his Senate race in Georgia, she quit the Democratic Party. Warnock's victory expanded the Democrat Senate majority, denying Cinema the ability to play spoiler, which she loves more than anything in the world. She lost her platform to suck up all the media attention and hijack the nation. I guess that was just too much for her. Cinema likes to portray herself as an independent, but she's really an attention-hungry narcissist who unabashedly seeks the spotlight at every opportunity. She is a corporate Democrat uh, who has, in fact, along with Senator Manchin, sabotaged enormously important legislation. Well, the evidence is clear. It's the way she dramatically remained mum on various congressional votes to the very end. She strings the nation along, forcing the entire country to pay attention to her. Oh, what will Kirsten Sinema do now? What's she going to do next? How's she going to vote? That's what she lives for, not the country or the party. She has milked these contrived situations for every last drop of publicity and notoriety. This is not the mark of a stateswoman or a serious lawmaker. It is the telltale sign that Sinema is in this for herself with a nation of mere afterthought. She wrote in the Arizona Republic this week, Arizonans expect our leaders to set aside political games. Who is she kidding? No one has played more games in Congress with maybe the exception of Joe Manchin. Kirsten Cinema has played more games than Chuck E. Cheese and LeBron James combined. If she played any more games, she'd come with a joystick attached to her head. Kirsten Cinema did not leave the Democratic Party because she's always been a party of one. She doesn't care about the Democrats. She doesn't care about Arizona, and she certainly doesn't care about America. 
Cinema is the party of I, me, and my. That's not independence, that is self-indulgence. The Democratic Party is better without her. In the Georgia Senate race, Raphael Warnock defeated Republican Herschel Walker. Thank God. The New York Times wrote about the race and said, Mr. Walker's loss will almost certainly lead to soul searching for the Republican Party. Soul search for the Republican Party? Is there a soul left to search for? The modern Republican Party on a soul search is like a treasure hunt in a dumpster. You're not going to find much there. Jesse Waters, a Fox News host, had grooming advice for his female viewers. Mm. Oh. And you need to stop chopping your hair off and calling us toxic. Well, Jesse, if you stop telling women how to wear their hair, maybe they wouldn't call you toxic so often. Jesse's macho man monologue was in response to Annabelle Rockwell, an heiress and Mount Holyoke graduate in Massachusetts, who claims that her mom hired a $300 a day deprogrammer to turn her conservative after college. Jesse then offered a wise alternative to Rockwell's expensive brainwashing. And if you want to save the $300 a day to deprogram someone from being woke, watch Fox. I couldn't agree more. The Fox is bargain basement brainwashing at its finest. Nike was on the verge of releasing an exciting new shoe by Brooklyn Nets star Kyrie Irving. Instead, he got the boot. He was dropped after embracing an anti-Semitic movie and then failing to convincingly apologize. Irving defiantly told Nike, you want to drop me? Just do it. And they did. To Nike's credit, they condemned all forms of anti-Semitism. A company spokesperson said, quote, Kyrie Irving is no longer a Nike athlete. The sides have parted ways. Irving maturely responded to Nike with a gif. There's nothing more priceless than being free. That's true. And there's nothing more expensive than bigotry. Irving joins internet wacko Alex Jones and the Hitler-loving Kanye West, losing millions of dollars because they preach hate to their millions of followers. They deserve every bit of scorn they get. Kyrie Irving once said that he thinks the world is flat. I can't wait till his bank account is flat too. Now we're going to talk about a Florida man, so this should be fun. Conservatives hiding behind morality as a front for mendacity is a given. I mean, it's really a stereotype at this point about conservatives who are preaching and not exactly doing as they say they are doing. Hypocrites is what they are. And the latest right-wing scoundrel is Florida State Representative Joe Harding. He sponsored Florida's notorious Don't Say Gay Law that forbid discussion on issues of sexual orientation and gender identity in schools. The great Christian moralist was charged this week by the Department of Justice with defrauding the Small Business Administration of $150,000. According to the newspaper The Hill, Harding allegedly abused economic injury disaster loan money by submitting false documentation, including submitting the names of inactive business entities. The Florida lawmaker is also charged with two counts of money laundering by transferring the allegedly stolen funds and two counts of making false statements to the SBA. Harding faces up to 35 years in prison. 35 years in prison. That's a long time. Representative Joe Harding better learn to say gay. He's going to need a boyfriend. Together, they can turn the big house into a loving home. It's the law of the universe, if you think about it. The more outspokenly conservative a person is, the more they are hiding something illegal or depraved. If a person is an outspoken right-wing conservative, if you search their closet for skeletons, you're likely to find a graveyard. Their entire movement is full of phonies who are using projection and deflection to mask their true ugly selves. Another example of a monster who veils his vile behavior in the guise of morality is Vladimir Putin. He led the fight to pass a new law that bans public expression of LGBTQ identity. The law makes it illegal to spread propaganda about, quote, non-traditional sexual relations in the media, advertising, movies, or on social media. Also, distributing to minors any information that causes children to want to change their sex was also banned. It passed their rubber stamp, Duma, which is like a fake Congress, 397 to nothing. You know, it's rich that a psychotic dictator who forces his own people to call the bloody war in Ukraine a special military operation is accusing LGBTQ people of propaganda. Russia has disbanded independent media. And propaganda is the fuel that powers Putin's perverse regime. 
While accusing innocent LGBTQ people of promoting immorality, Putin's Russia targets civilian infrastructure in Ukraine, lobs missiles at Ukrainian apartment buildings and playgrounds with children. It tortures and rapes Ukrainian civilians in Russian-occupied territories and kidnaps Ukrainian children and sends them to Russia, which is a war crime. Though this shameless war criminal who poisons his political opponent poses as a devout Christian, Putin's values are more in line with a serial killer than Christ. And you know, this war in Ukraine is really taking a toll on Vladimir Putin. He's cracking up. He's losing his marbles. Humiliated by his failures in Ukraine, a deflated Vladimir Putin has hidden from public view. The New York Times reports that he, quote, held only one extended public event from November 10th to November 20th an absence from the limelight that went unexplained by the Kremlin. The depressed dictator reemerged this week in a series of strange public appearances, some of which he appeared to be drunk. The New York Times wrote, On social media, some expressed surprise that the Kremlin released the footage, given that Vladimir Putin, whose sobriety and self-control are central to his carefully crafted image in Russia, looked like he may have been tipsy as he swayed back and forth. So Putin hits the vodka bottle and then starts spewing crazy shit this week. He's stumbling around and starts rattling off delusional conspiracy theories in public. He claimed that, quote, national elements in Poland were dreaming of seizing parts of Western Ukraine. Yeah, like that's going to happen. He narcissistically compared himself with Peter the Great. Yeah, and while we're at it, I'm Abraham Lincoln. I mean, we can all play that game. Putin then said the fact that there are new territories that he annexed, uh, he said this is a significant result for Russia. It's a serious result, except for the fact that his overrated paper tiger military is losing the war. It doesn't control any of these territories, or barely in a couple. Here is the craziest Putin rambling yet. The dictator bizarrely said that, quote, in some Western countries, animals in the zoo are killed in front of children, butchered, and so on. This absolutely does not correspond to our culture, the culture of the peoples of the Russian Federation. I have trouble believing that the Russian people are stupid enough to believe such obvious, ridiculous propaganda. If they are dumb enough to believe these lies, they're ready for QAnon. They should open up a chapter in Moscow. So anyway, Putin is now morphing it into a malevolent version of Boris Yeltsin. He's making drunken public appearances. His brain is marinating in a toxic combination of vodka and conspiracy theories while he issues new threats of nuclear war. I mean, what could go wrong here? Let's move on to Donald Trump's corruption castle, mar loco Way too many Jewish people were seduced by Donald Trump. They were tricked by his symbolic, yet largely empty, gestures to Israel. They were also stung by rising anti-Semitism on the left, which is real, particularly at universities. So they fell for Donald Trump's pro-Israel shtick. Now American Jewish people and Israel suffer the consequences of Republican Jewish naivete. Trump recently dined with anti-Semite Kanye West and neo-Nazi Nick Fuentes. The former president was criticized for the supper of white supremacy. Jewish groups issued strong statements condemning Trump's actions, as tends to happen when a former president dines with Nazis. But the criticism hurt Trump's snowflake feelings. He's a thin-skinned, malignant narcissist. So he was pissed. He, he lashed out at the Jewish community. He trotted out an anti-Semitic trope questioning Jewish loyalty on his bogus copycat Twitter, known as Truth Social, which has no truth and is antisocial, Trump said, quote, How quickly Jewish leaders forgot that I was by far the best president for Israel. This lack of loyalty to their greatest friends and allies is why large numbers in Congress and so many others have stopped giving support to Israel. Bullshit. Let's set the record straight. Trump was a disaster, an unmitigated disaster for American Jews. He single-handedly empowered a domestic movement of white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Thanks, Donald. He brought them out of the fringe and brought them to dinner. He called the Nazis at Charlottesville, who chanted, the Jews will not replace us. Remember that? He called on some very fine people, and yet Republican Jews didn't seem to notice. I don't know, maybe Donald Trump thought they were such fine people they make good dinner guests to join Nick Fuentes and Kanye West next time. 
As a result of Trump's actions, hate crimes against Jewish people soared in the United States. And Trump was even a bigger disaster when it comes to Israel. He injected extreme partisanship into Congress over support for Israel. Israel needs bipartisan support for long-term national security, and Trump tried to wreck that and came very close to doing so. Trump did absolutely nothing to foster peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. He wasted four entire years with zero progress. So the issue continues to fester today, harming both Israelis and Palestinians. However, the Trump administration's largest fiasco by far when it comes to Israel was letting Russia play a bigger role in the Middle East. Donald Trump is beholden to Vladimir Putin, and we still don't know precisely why. But the former president allowed Putin to dramatically expand Russia's presence in Syria. Thanks to Trump, Israel needs Russia's permission to intercept or disrupt Iranian weapons transfers to terrorists in Syria and Lebanon. Russia has generally allowed Israel to protect its national security and intercept these weapons. But now, with the war in Ukraine, Russia is partnering like never before in Iran. Putin is so desperate for Iranian drones because his stockpile of missiles is dwindling. Now he owes Iran. The Washington Post reports that Iran had agreed to supply up to 6,000 drones to Russia. How long is it going to be before Iran demands that Russia stops allowing Israel access to Syrian airspace to disrupt Iranian weapon shipments? Then what? Israel is going to be forced to compromise its national security or defy Putin, leading to a potential military conflict with Russia. Long before Hitler, Jews were tormented by Russian czars who unleashed terrifying and deadly pogroms. Now the nation of the pogroms, Russia, is ensconced in Israel's backyard, and they are now calling the shots and in cahoots with Iran. You can thank Donald Trump for creating a potential existential crisis for Israel. Donald Trump is not the best president for Israel. He's by far the worst. The facts bear that out. I hope Jewish Republicans wise up and quit the party. Donald Trump and his party are not on the side of American Jews or Israel. Donald Trump is so spiteful that he is unleashing a tsunami of hatred upon all Jews, which includes his own family. Ivanka, Jared, and their three children are Jewish. What kind of a world is Donald Trump creating for his own grandchildren? Speaking of anti-Semitism, I've got to get this off my chest. I was on a listserv this week. The topic was hate crimes increasing against American Jews. And a person wrote, what about the Palestinians? Why would you inject that into a conversation about the United States? I'm an American. I've never been to Israel. What the hell are you asking me for? If we were talking about hate crimes against Asian Americans, would you ask, what about China and the Uyghurs? Of course not. If we were talking about hate crimes about African Americans, would you ask, well, what's your opinion about the situation in Rwanda? No, you wouldn't. Now, if the conversation is about Israeli foreign policy, the Palestinian topic is fair game. But if it's a domestic conversation, don't inject your agenda. It's obnoxious. And doing so is anti-Semitism because it's making the false assumption that all Jewish people have influence over another country's policies, even if we've never been there. So please stop doing it. You are offending American Jews and doing absolutely nothing to help the Palestinians. But I'm sure you're making yourself feel good, aren't you? We now turn to the next part of our show. Under the Microscope, where we take up close and personal looks at key issues affecting all of us. Today, we will deviate from our usual fare of exposing hypocritical conservatives and Republicans. I'd say that we are going to criticize people on our own team, except I'm not on a team. I'm not wearing a jersey. I live in a country, one that I'm trying to make better. And we can't do that when key allies let us down. And when they do, we have to say so. If we don't, hold them accountable. Are we any better than those we criticize on the right? Anyway, enjoy the segment. In 1998, the religious right launched the Truth and Love advertising campaign. In newspapers across the country, the stories of ex-gay activists were featured prominently. These activists said they had magically transformed from gay to straight through prayer and therapy. The stars of this campaign were John and Ann Polk, who appeared on the cover of Newsweek. Michael Johnston was also the star of the Truth and Love television campaign. 
A decade ago, I walked away from homosexuality through the power of Jesus Christ. At that time, I worked for the Human Rights Campaign. I was put in charge of debunking the ex-gay industry and proving it was a fraud. My first effort was to document those harmed by ex-gay conversion therapy. I created a booklet of survivors called Finally Free, How Love and Self-Acceptance Saved Us from the Ex-Gay Ministries. As far as I know, this is the first time survivor stories were collected and disseminated to challenge the validity of ex-gay programs. Next, I set out to prove that ex-gay leaders were charlatans and frauds. I did this by photographing John Polk in a gay bar. This severely undermined the premise of the Truth and Love campaign. I showed that those who claimed they had changed were not telling the truth. It was an elaborate hoax sponsored by millions of dollars on the religious right. I followed this up by joining attorney Michael Hamer in Virginia and exposing Michael Johnston, the star of the Truth and Love television campaign. We caught Johnston in a gay motel orgy, hardly an activity you'd expect from an ex-gay leader. These exposures badly eroded trust and believability in these phony programs. I also wrote a book nominated for two Lambda Literary Awards. It's called Anything But Straight, Unmasking the Scandals and Lies Behind the Ex-Gay Myth. In 2006, President George W. Bush invited ex-gay leaders from Exodus International to the White House. In response, I started Truth Wins Out to monitor and expose ex-gay leaders and their movement. We traveled across the country from Alaska to Alabama, protesting ex-gay conversion conferences such as Focus on the Families, Love One Out. Our media included ABC World News Tonight, The Rachel Maddow Show, The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, AC360, Anderson Cooper Show, The O'Reilly Factor, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Our work was quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Rolling Stone Magazine, The New York Times, The Advocate, and many other publications. In other words, we frame the issue, define your opponents, and set the terms of the debate. We created an innovative website called Respect My Research. It called out right-wing propagandists who distorted the findings of legitimate researchers. So these therapies are, are marketed inaccurately. The therapists are saying, we can change your orientation, when in fact all of the data suggests that that's not the case. When ex-gay activists spoke in Uganda, Truth Wins Out organized the American Prayer Hour, an event which shined a spotlight on the role American evangelicals at the National Prayer Breakfast played in the introduction of Uganda's notorious Kill the Gays bill. We led a successful campaign to have Apple remove Exodus International's ex-gay iPhone app, which targeted children. We launched a high-profile undercover investigation, proving Representative Michelle Bachman and her husband Marcus own a clinic that practiced ex-gay conversion therapy, even though they denied that's what they were doing. Our operation made a mockery of conversion therapy and became fodder for comedians worldwide. The totality of our efforts to bring down the ex-gay industry were working better than we could have ever imagined. I've never regretted leaving homosexuality. I'm sorry, but I've never seen a real success story of anyone who's changed from homosexual to heterosexual. By 2012, Love Went Out had disbanded. Exodus International had shut down. In God's word, it says, this isn't what I created you for. I gave you the, the wrong information, and I'm sorry. The Truth and Love campaign was completely debunked and disgraced. The conversion therapy group, NARTH, was so humiliated and failed, it had to change its name and rebrand. It's never recovered fully from those days. Truth Wins Out did not do this alone. A small band of committed activists from the blogs Box Turtle Bulletin and Ex-Gay Watch played key roles. The survivor organization Beyond Ex-Gay was an important component in this effort. Soul Force had an impact as did the Gay Christian Network, as well as Dr. Jack Drescher, who played an instrumental role in shutting these organizations down. These groups didn't always agree. We had different personalities and a wide array of tactics, but we never had to question whether the information they provided was fact-checked or their spokespeople legit. It's depressing that we must factor that into the equation now. These aforementioned groups were small organizations or blogs. So how did a bunch of ragtag activists defeat the powerful and politically connected ex-gay industry? We were able to shut these groups down because we had truth on our side, while our opponents had nothing but lies. Conversely, we had well-documented stories of verified spokespeople. The mucus was going to emanate from me as the demon of homosexual. homosexual I left my body. 
This is what they told me. That it would leave my body in an orange mucus. I went to his friend's house and he sat on the ground and he had me lay in his arms for a solid hour, chest to chest. This gives families false hope. It gives families a leg to stand on in threatening their children in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the first ones that they introduced to me was rubber band therapy. Meanwhile, our opponents would put forth a parade of unvetted buffoons as their spokespeople. It's non-sexual. It establishes like parent-child relationship. So he didn't experience this growing up with his dad. We took great care to make sure everyone was who they said they were. It's called professionalism. In 2012, after most of the well-known and influential ex-gay conversion programs had already been defeated, two major national organizations decided to take on conversion therapy. I welcome this with open arms because finally large organizations with resources such as lawyers and lobbyists had entered the fray. The two organizations were the Southern Poverty Law Center and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, which started its Born Perfect program. At a Waffle House in Alabama, I brainstormed with Heidi Byrick, Mark Potok, and others who worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center. The result was a historic consumer fraud lawsuit that shut down the ex-gay program, Jews offering new alternatives to homosexuality. The lawsuit featured Chaim Levin and Ben Unger, who were originally featured in a Truth Wins Out video. While I was standing there without my clothes on, he asked me to touch my genitals. Once again, I communicated that I'm not comfortable with it, and he was just like, just, just, you know, just feel yourself. Just, just feel it for a second. I was uncomfortable with this process. I wasn't, you know, very happy about it, and I did keep it to myself until about a couple of months ago. And at the point where I was at my undershirt, I felt really uncomfortable because, you know, he was a man who was much older than me, and I was around 20, and I just didn't want to get, take my clothes off in front of him. Next, I spoke with the National Center for Lesbian Rights, or NCLR, an organization that I had previously respected and looked forward to working with. Sadly, they immediately informed me that they were using Sam Brinton to run their national campaign. They were offering them a huge platform they had not previously had. What? I was stunned. I was stunned. Sam had a remarkably colorful story, an insatiable appetite for media publicity, yet miraculously couldn't name his conversion torture therapist. Physical therapy was my hands being um, tied down and blocks of ice being placed on my hands. Then pictures of men holding hands would be shown to me, so that way I would associate the concept of the pain of ice with a man touching me. It worked really, really, really well. My dad could barely even hug me anymore. They allegedly went to this torture therapist for two to three years, yet could not identify them. There was no way to verify if their story was legitimate. I personally warned, no, begged NCLR and their Born Perfect campaign that they must verify Brinton's testimony before using it. I said that Brinton isn't who they say they are. It would undermine the reputations of our anti-conversion efforts. It would harm our network of survivors. NCLR, unfortunately, indignantly responded that we must believe all survivors, to which I replied, yes, we should trust, but shouldn't we also verify? Apparently not. Their poor judgment was inexplicable because there were dozens of incredible survivors where we didn't have to worry about their credentials. We knew who they said they were. NCLR had the nerve, the unmitigated gall, to center their national campaign on the only, I repeat, only survivor in the entire United States of America who could not tell you where they received their ex-gay counseling. Why? For almost 15 years, we knew beyond a reasonable doubt that the testimonies of our survivors were incontrovertibly true. NCLR and their Born Perfect campaign lowered the standard to, it's okay to use survivors' testimonies as long as you can't prove that their stories are false. This was a terribly unfortunate paradigm shift. Because once you prove a story is true, it's always true. If the standard is reduced to, oh, you can't prove it's false, well, that might be true today. But tomorrow, your spokesperson might be unmasked as a fraud. For 15 wildly successful years, we had standards. And thanks to Born Perfect, they were flushed down the toilet overnight. Equally egregious, the Trevor Project eventually hired Sam Brinton. Like NCLR's Born Perfect, they never bothered to verify Sam's story. This is a multi-million dollar organization that couldn't bother to do a basic fact check? What the hell? As we know, Sam Brinton was just charged with stealing a woman's $2,000 suitcase from the Minneapolis airport and lying about it to police. 
They were caught on surveillance video ripping the identification tag off the woman's luggage while quickly scurrying away to avoid detection. At first, Brinton said they were tired and picked up the wrong bag. However, that wasn't possible because they checked no luggage. Whoops. Thanks to Born Perfect and the Trevor Project's shoddy standards, this depressing story went mega viral. The right wing went wild, using Brinton's story to brutally attack our movement and defame our community. As a result of their carelessness and recklessness, the movement to fight the ex-gay conversion industry received more negative press in one week than we had in the previous 15 years. Thanks, guys. All we ask you to do is verify your spokesperson is legit, and you failed. The scandal was a fresh opportunity to revisit Sam Brinton's dubious testimony. For example, Brinton has a strikingly vivid memory of their therapy sessions. Brinton alleges their practitioner used aversion therapy, which included sessions where they were tortured with extreme heat, ice, and needles. Brinton alleged, um, We then went into the, um, the month of hell. The month of hell consisted of tiny needles being stuck into my fingers, um, and then uh, pictures of explicit acts between men would be shown and I'd be electrocuted. In another instance, Britton told NBC News, quote, there were seven King James Bibles on a stack on the coffee table. Britton recalled their conversion therapist's small office in an Orlando, Florida strip mall. I checked with a top expert on conversion therapy in the Orlando region. He said that there is no known conversion office in a strip mall that existed during the years that Britton attended therapy. After the airport incident, I called Britton's mother, Peggy Jo Britton. She told me that her son had attended therapy, but that it was not conversion therapy. So my mom finds me up on the roof, uh, says, you know, she will love me again if I will just change. Uh, which is not the thing to say to a person standing on the edge of a, of a building. Um, my dad um, has held a gun up to my head multiple times. For the record, she also denied Sam was ever physically abused by their father after coming out, or that they had ever attempted suicide, as Brenton claimed in their testimony. Interestingly, when I urged Brenton to reveal their mystery torture therapist that they said they spent at least two years on a couch with, Brenton wrote in the Queerty comments section, quote, I was indirectly in contact with Wayne, and although I know he wants me to send the information of the therapist, that is simply not an option. Counselor after counselor has seen me revert to near suicidal tendencies when I try to dig deep into the memories of the time, and I simply don't have his name. I can picture him as clear as day, in my nightmares, but his name is not there. It seems Brinton's prodigious memory only fails when they are asked to verify their story. Brinton said that they could clearly see this therapist in their nightmares. If that's true, why hasn't Brinton looked online to try to find this monster so he won't torture other children? How many conversion therapists could there be in Orlando anyway? I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to find if you looked. Other holes in Brinton's story have emerged. In some versions, Brinton claims that they went to a Florida therapist, yet the Des Moines Register reports that they, quote, began a series of out-of-state treatments. Why won't Brinton clarify which state the reporter was referring to? A 2011 LGBTQ Nation story reports that, quote, Sam specifies his counselor was a religious therapist and not a doctor. Yet, Brinton penned a 2014 piece for the National Center for Lesbian Rights, that described his counselor as a psychotherapist. The same year, he told the UN's Committee Against Torture in Switzerland, When I was a child, a licensed psychotherapist tried and failed to change something I never chose. So, when Brinton was trying to specifically ban licensed conversion therapists from practicing, they suddenly upgraded the credentials of their own cryptic therapist. Interesting. I'm not definitively saying that Brinton's story isn't true. That's not the point, however. What I am saying is there are fewer red flags in China than Brinton's story. For Born Perfect and the Trevor Project to use the shaky, inconsistent, unproven testimony as the cornerstone of their high-profile national campaigns was unnecessarily risky and negligent. And it has now backfired in a spectacular fashion because the type of person who would conceivably invent a conversion therapy story is also the kind of individual, if you think about it, who would steal luggage at an airport. This is a character issue. That's why you do background checks. I've decided to speak out now because accountability is important. We correctly criticize the right when they do wrong. We also must be held accountable on the left when we come up short and fail our community. When I joined the LGBTQ effort in college, I joined a movement, not a cult. 
I will not be cowed into silence lest I upset big organizations that think their size makes them beyond reproach. I, for one, will not help cover this up while they take cover and hope this scandal goes away. I also spoke out because I noticed that when Sam Brinton was charged with felony theft, the Trevor Project and NCLR's Born Perfect campaign felt eerily silent. It reminded me of when Donald Trump's cronies get in trouble and Trump pretends he doesn't know them. Brinton is big news specifically because he was elevated by your two organizations. You were warned and you didn't care. You didn't listen. The least you could do is stop hiding and take personal responsibility for your mistakes. As the person who played a key role in starting the movement to fight ex-gay programs, my message to Born Perfect and the Trevor Project is learn from your errors and do better. Can you do that? Look, I support your efforts, but we must do our critically important work the right way. We can't take lazy shortcuts and choose expedience over prudence. Thanks for watching The Wayne Besson Show. I hope you enjoyed it. We are available on YouTube. Our audio podcast is also available on all major platforms, including Apple, Anchor, and Spotify. Don't forget, and this is important, subscribe to The Wayne Besson Show on our YouTube channel so you won't miss anything. And tell your friends about us. Until we meet again, see you next time. Uh -huh.